Once, there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. Suppose I'm writing a novel. I write, Mary laid down her book, next moment came a knock at the door. For Mary, who's got to live in the imaginary time of the story, there's no interval between putting down the book and hearing the knock. But I, her creator, between writing the first part of that sentence and the second, may have gone out for an hour's walk and spent the whole hour thinking about Mary. We make things by the law in which we are made. We create because we are created. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, in the darkness bind them. Tolkien and Lewis, both in their way, lifted me out of this world to show me a thundering beauty. And when I read the last sentence and came tumbling back to earth, I could still hear the peal. I hear it to this day. God allowed those stories to lift the veil on the imaginary world to show me the real world behind it, which ended up being, in the end, the one I was already in. The real world, at least in part, isn't out there somewhere, nor is it in my mind. It's here, right under my feet, all around me. Tolkien and Lewis held the fabric of Narnia or Middle-earth in one hand and clutched our world in the other, building a bridge across which we could set out for perilous realms and yet return safely with some of the beauty we found there. My first and last philosophy, that which I believe in with unbroken certainty, I learnt in the nursery. I generally learnt it from a nurse, that is, from the solemn and star-appointed priestess at once of democracy and tradition. The things I believed most then, the things I believe most now, are the things called fairy tales. We live in a moment that's unlike any other moment, a moment of bizarre tyranny, a moment of overreach. I was nearly torn apart by a crazy oh. doctor. A moment of fear. It's like, and how are we living? How are we standing up in this moment? I was made asleep by a bunch of mangy pirates. Mm -hmm. Are we full of joy? Like, are we characters who are full of joy and unafraid? And eaten, got that? Eaten by a fire-breathing dragon. And that's a bitch of me, tossed, squashed, and scared practically to death. It's like, how do we image God in this particular narrative in yeah. which we've been placed in this chapter. And we get trained for that by reading about Sam and Frodo and Aragorn and Gandalf and reading, of, you know, Charlotte's Web and Animal Farm and reading about Prince Caspian. Like when you're little, you read those things and you read stories when you're yeah. older and it reinforces what is the courageous action of the character in this moment. Yet you stand before me. Well. Yeah. Think, boy. What kind of an adventure would you have had if I brought you here with a turn of the page? I wept bitterly. And then I said to myself, when everything happens quite miserably, then he sends help. I have always read so. People must first of all suffer a great deal before they can bring anything to accomplishment. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body.
God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire cold chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plough, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth, whose beauty is past change. Praise him. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Poets at War. We are going to be talking about heraldry and iconography and that sort of a thing today. Uh, sort of a broad discussion. Uh, I think a lot of people know these things by instinct, but maybe not in depth. Uh, I'm your host, Joshua David Lang. With me tonight are Brendan Sunshine and Alexander Robinson, Robertson. I always want to go Robinson for some reason. You're not Swiss family. Because, you're, because uh, you've seen me the Robinsons. Yeah, well, I, I, I associate the name of more with Swiss family Robinson and Robinson Crusoe. It's always like an island name to me. But anyway, uh, yeah, so we're going to be getting to that here. But uh, right now we're going to be catching up and... Uh, Asking the brief question, what are your expectations for June? But we can talk about anything. We were talking about Apple VR headsets uh, coming out. We were talking about uh, uh, all kinds of craziness going on in the brood. Uh, questions about nudity um, and th their their place or lack thereof, in my opinion, in movies. Uh, what do you guys want to touch on? What do you want to update us on? Brendan, start us off. Oh, okay. To go into me. Yeah. Well, um. I had a uh, wonderful conversation with a friend of mine who she actually published uh, children's books and illustrated them herself and um, like wrote and illustrated and then published all of them, did the whole shebang. Um, and I actually got on a call with her and um, basically picked her brain about the process. And there was a ton of stuff that I didn't know. Like I've got, I still have my notebook here of stuff that as I was talking with her, like need to know. Like if I'm illustrating, I need to make know if it's going to be full bleed, meaning the color goes all the way to the edge of the page, or is it not? You know, is there going to be a margin? Um, you know, I needed to figure out what on earth my uh, uh, page size was in the program, right? So when I'm scanning in or drawing in program, if I'm doing it digitally, I need to know what the size is. I need to know what the DPI is. Um, 
petty to remember, don't have anything important within one inch of the edge because there's a chance that it's going to get cropped off. Mm -hmm. um, need to, I apparently, um, and it makes sense now that uh, like, I think about it, but a lot of publishing companies have limits to the number of pages, mm -hmm. not an upper limit, a lower limit. Mm -hmm. You cannot publish a book with them unless it's at least, the number usually is 32 pages. Mm -hmm. The reason why it's 32 is because one sheet of paper in production makes eight pages. Right. And that's four sheets of paper. Four sheets of paper makes 32. Um, I needed to know file size. I needed to remember that, you know, you know, all, all this stuff, basically. And so June... You know, you asked, what does June look like? Well, for me, it's going to be working, taking care of my little boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I really want to get this uh, this book project that I, um, uh, it's an ABC book. It sounds like that. The, if you uh, watched, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you, if you watched the last broadcast, you know what it is. It's like you have to get like through an hour and a half of everyone else before I even join. But um, I didn't know. I thought you guys were done, but. <laughs> you were still going. It's like, okay, cool. Um, it's great. It's awesome. But yeah, so for me, June is going to be like me trying to crank that out, just get it done. Because I'd love to be able to uh, be able to have it be a thing for my son and also for my sister's daughter because she was just born a month bef a month and a half before Tristan was. So that's excellent. Yeah, I've I've dabbled with, books and printing and all that other sorts of stuff and it always just gets uh far too uh either expensive or complicated for me i i'm working on my own printing process uh slowly over time and i am going to get there eventually but uh still got a ways to go alex tell me about what's going on with you and what your june's looking like well um being a big techie um, and June's already been pretty big with the WWDC happening yesterday and all the news that was dropped there. I'm a giant Apple fan. And so that was pretty cool to see all the stuff that got dropped there, software and hardware. All the Android updates. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> getting all the, getting some of the features that Android has had for years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it is what it is. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. It absolutely I'm not is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, there, there's a lot of really interesting stuff as far as design philosophy goes that harkens back to Steve Jobs and all that fun stuff right. uh, in Apple. Looking forward in the month, uh, I have a camping trip this weekend, and uh, one of my best friends is back home on leave from Guam. Uh, you met him in the broadcast, uh, last, last broadcast, Alex. So super happy that he's coming back. That's fantastic. Is yeah. Back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel like I need to make the obligatory joke. Do you have thirty books picked out that you're going to read in the month of June? <laughs> I do not have thirty books picked out. I'm like three quarters of the way through Messianic Character of the American Education System by Rush Dooney, and that one is that. It's a long book. Did you start that one today? For me, uh, I started it three or four days ago. The day that I finished the last book. That I uh, the day that I finished Albion, I started it. Yeah. So, wow. That is the way through. It only oh, it must be a huge book then. Good grief. <laughs> it's, it's it's a big book. It's like an eighteen hour audio book. Nice. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that's fantastic. Yeah. I I'm a huge Rush Dooney guy. My uh, pastor I grew up under. He um, he was uh, friends with Rush Dooney, uh, Joe Moorcraft, and um, I just I I think Rush Dooney is one of the most slept on authors and all of christendom like i know that he has his you know following and everything but like mm -hmm. just, it, it, he, he really just to me the two people who really nailed the theonomy argument in general were rush Jr. Were, were bonson yeah but uh, that's who most people refer to when talking about harvard camp's version of theonomy um, but Rush Dooney, to be honest with you, I, there's like one thing I disagree with him on, and he actually has like a full uh, utopic isn't the right word, but it's it's the only one I can think of. You know, an ideal system of uh, theonomy and what it would look like. And I literally disagree with him on like one thing. It's it's ridiculous. Um, is that is that laid out in Institutes of Biblical Law? I believe so. 
Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty... That's on my to read list. Yeah. So, uh, spoiler alert, the one thing that I disagree with him on is the eventual return of Lover at Marriage. So, there you go. Um, mm. <laughs> so, I, I, I disagree with it returning uh, because it was <laughs> for Christ, and he says uh, it would naturally return. Uh, not something that would need to even necessarily be, you know, litigated or anything uh, initially, but it would naturally return if these other things were healed. So, yeah. It just moved way up my TBR list. <laughs> just fascinating little snippets. Well, uh, if you guys are good on catching up, then we can go ahead and move forward on to our main segment. Attention all Christian writers and creative peoples! Are you searching for a place to share your work and receive encouragement from fellow wordsmiths? Look no further than the Broodcast. Inspired by the legendary Inklings of old, a group of writers who banded together during the Second Great War, the Broodcast is your monthly gathering for inspiration, fellowship, and critique. Join us as we share our stories and support our fellow soldiers on our creative missions. Enlist in the Broodcast community today at joshuadavidling.com slash brood. Travel cyberspace. Serve the greatest cause. Join the ranks of the Brood today. Imagine if you had everything Tolkien ever wrote. Well, you can't have his, but you can have mine. The Ling Lyricanium is $10 a month, and you can find it at joshuadavidling.com slash LL. That's joshuadavidling.com slash LL. Well... Gents, we uh, decided on one of our topics being heraldry and iconography. I wanted to get into this partly because, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to talk about the intersection uh, on this podcast, the intersection of, um, you know, uh, uh, our faith and theology, but also our artistry, people who create things and, and understand their purposes. So I have a working uh, definition I'd love y'all's input on for heraldry specifically um it is uh <clears throat> representative meaning applied uh it's not just color it's not just you know saying you know this is that and that is this and I i'm just arbitrarily putting some kind of you know uh meaning to something it's also not saying that if you have the color red in something it has to mean this and only this right um, so it is, it is, uh, um, uh, representative meaning applied. Um, I don't think you can have heraldry without ap application from an artist, from an artist, but at the same time, it has to be a, a, a you can't just arbitrarily say something, you know, means this or that. What do you guys think? Is that too broad? No. <laughs> I, well, I, in my completely uninformed opinion, I like it. Okay. Okay, well, uh, here's the question that I've got. What do you mean by applied? Uh, applied, literally. I, I mean, it's straightforward. <laughs> if we need to go for a definition, we can go for a definition. But Well, okay, let me rephrase the question. What is being applied? What is being applied? Uh, yes. The, 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 the representative meaning. It The representative meaning already exists. But you are okay. applying it. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying that you are generating it. I'm saying you are applying it. Okay. I, I have... <laughs> All right. So what you're saying is a symbol. Yes. And we're going to be very vague here. All okay. right. A symbol has a meaning. Mm -hmm. And heraldry is taking that symbol and putting it in something specific? Yeah. Basically. Now, are you so? Does this mean that heraldry has to be on something like a shield, a helmet, a flag, a whatever, a screen, a screen? But but the point of heraldry in your instance, you're 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 requiring the heraldry to be displayed to to be. Let's put it this way: uh, appreciated with the five senses and not just the intellect. I okay. But I would make an argument that that could be true of more than just heraldry. You could apply sure. that to most art. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But I right. think art also has, I think art 
has a level of meaning that is um, the volition of the artist uh, through the message, right? And heraldry is more, this is something that already exists that I am applying to this instance for the sake of, of, of my argument, basically, which art is art, art is an argument to some extent, my apologetic, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, okay, but like, let's, um, you want so to, I want agree to with it down a little further. Yeah. Because, because okay. my, my, because part of, part of what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at, like, like, um, you say, oh, you know, we're not putting, like, we're not saying, oh, red has to be the meaning this right. or red, whatever, but you do have sort of, well, not, well, okay, I say that. That's not actually true. I was about to say there is almost a certain ubiquitousness to color theory and color sure. emotional theory. No, that's true. However, that isn't necessarily true because... It's partially in, true. At least in the world, there's a Western theory and there's an Eastern theory and there's... You know, yeah. I mean, but 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 generally speaking, um, there are uh, similarities between all of them. You know, they're not 100%, right. but there are similarities between all of them. In the East... Mm-hmm. Black is the color that the heroes wear because white is the color of death. Right. In the West, it's flipped around. Right. In the West, purple is regal and royal. Purple is a royal color. Now, the reason that is the case is because of the um, Expense. difficulty of getting purple dye. Mm-hmm. But that's but in China, if I remember correctly, I think red is the color of royalty in China, or at least the color of wealth. Whenever you want to pay somebody off in a either, whenever you want to pay somebody, you give them a red envelope. Mm-hmm. Now red en- now that red envelope could be a bribe. It could be just payment. Right. You know. Right. Uh, but uh, like um, unfortunately now, like you get a red envelope. Or like in the West, we hear about the Chinese giving out red envelopes. We think they mean bribe. It's not necessarily bribe, but it's still that sort of that red color is still right. has some tie to that wealth, to the money, to well, it's power, and it's corruption, and power. all of those sorts of concepts. You know, big power, right. big government, that sort of a thing. And then you flip back over to the West. Red, I think you know, a lot of people say red. Oh, red anger. I don't think it's so much anger as passion. Well, yes. Uh, red uh, traditionally associate. I'm, I'm reading off a thing, you know, and the, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the yeah. it, it's uh, color meaning, color-meanings.com. Uh, but th- I've read this many places. Red is traditionally associated with military strength and cunning, martyr for a cause, warrior, and magnanimity. So it's actually like specifically um masculine arts uh having to do with blood but not necessarily anger but like you said passion it's it's yeah. it's it's uh aggression it is strength it is you know that warrior sort of heart so but even but uh, if we go to modern though we also think red roses right <laughs> that, that's romantic. why i think like romantic you look at go into Go into a Barnes and Noble or a bookstore and go to the romance section. Mm-hmm. And how many of those trashy romance novels have a very red velvet cover right. on them? Mm-hmm. Maybe not actual velvet, but the 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 like yeah. red curtains, red sheets, red something. Right. Yeah. So that's why I said passion, because it's not necessarily passion like, oh, I love, but like passion as in no. I believe strongly in this and I am willing to fight you for it. Or I believe strongly in this and I'm willing to, you know, I, I, I believe strongly in love or whatever. That's why I said passion. So the fact that that color theory already exists. So you, you're saying that the heraldry then is cause, cause I guess what I would say is like, yes, your definition works, but I think you can apply that to most art. For me, the heraldic significance comes from the fact that it's, being applied to something else okay what do you mean by so, something else specifically so the Habsburgs mm-hmm. was a royal family in germany mm-hmm. um their heraldry was a double-headed eagle okay the double-headed eagle had some significance and the Habsburgs said we're going to use this as a symbol of our family mm-hmm. so we are taking that thing and we are applying it to our family we are we are taking that meaning and putting it there 
So I agree that there's an applied meaning, but I think the meaning has to be applied to an external thing specifically. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I meant external, so that's good. That's a good nail down, a little bit further further of a definition. I also think it has to be something that is experienced with the five senses and not something that is purely like an abstract, not 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 a, a supposal or a, or a fable or an idea or even a song necessarily. A song can have heraldic connections to it but it's it's a little bit harder um it has to be through the lyrics usually um you know it's not something that you can get through like an instrumental piece necessarily um in my opinion um but go ahead yeah but then that but and uh, i really should let alex talk because i talk too much but to your point on the five senses this is where the heraldry comes into play because it's representing something else yes now we're going to use it right we mark territory. It's on our flags. It's on our shields of our warriors. It's on, it's the family crest of our house. Our ring, our signet ring has this symbol on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to smear a, smell a heraldry, but okay. Uh, <laughs> you said five senses. I'm just well, I'm not I mean, sure how. I, the, I, I would say that, uh, yeah, there's, uh, you're probably right in that regard. Maybe four of the five senses, but I don't know. Anyway, go ahead, Alex. No, but, but, you, you, you got something? Yeah. Um, well, as I said, I have very, very little knowledge on this, <laughs> though. I just went to the 1828 uh, Webster's Dictionary and looked up heraldry. Good place. And I, I agree. It's the best dictionary. Um, and its definition is the art or office of a herald. Heraldry is the art, practice, or science of recording genealogies, emblazoning arms or ensigns or memorial. It also teaches whatever relates to the marshalling of cavalcades, processions, and other public ceremonies. And that's a good place to go for um, etymological purposes. Uh, the, 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 the representation isn't just a static representation. It's meant to herald. It's meant to announce the presence of something. Um, which I feel like is what Brennan was getting at. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. The, um, you know, red announces the presence in the West anyway, in our way of thinking of a warrior type, you know, um, of, of, of warfare and battle and passion. And, um, you know, I, I, another thing is McDonald's specifically, um, <clears throat> they when they were uh, I, I remember hearing them talk about it in the movie. Uh, was it the founder? What Whatever. The founder um, with Michael Keaton. But also, I've, I've looked it up. One of the main reasons they went with the red and the yellow um, is red, and, and a lot of food companies do this, red uh, signifies hunger as well because it's a passion. Uh, and it also, the yellow is, and, and gold is, is uh, in the West, meaning generosity. Um, it's it's uh, wealth, but it's also generosity. It's this, this sense of plenty, the sense of come unto me and I will give to you what you need that sort of a thing. So um, <clears throat> that is that is purposeful on McDonald's and many other food companies' parts. That's why you see a lot of red cereal boxes and things of that sort. Um, go the, ahead. The flip, side, uh, the flip side of that is that whenever you have diners that have a blue plate special, mm -hmm. uh, that name came from, it's not generally on a blue plate anymore, right. but uh, that name came from, they would actually have a blue plate with a smaller portion size because supposedly blue makes you less hungry. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that came from, but that isn't something that I have heard. I also defy you to hear any lyric or words that talk about golden fields. Mm -hmm. And if your mind pictures anything Whenever you hear the phrase golden fields, I don't think you think of a small little meadow. Right. Mm -hmm. You're usually thinking of a large amount. Plenty. That would yeah. yeah, that would go back to the plenty idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, one color, I, I'm big on the colors, as you guys know. <laughs> Everyone who's listening and Brendan and Alex, I've had many hour conversations with you all on colors. Um, but the uh, uh, one of the ones that I wanted to touch on briefly um, was black in the West, because I think it's a very interesting color um, when it comes to uh, the way we look at it. It's been used lots of different ways. Obvious one is like death, that sort of a thing. That's why it's associated with bad guys. 
but it's also associated with grief. You think about funerals, right? Uh, it also is uh, associated with wisdom and prudence and slow of, you know, slow of speech, slow of thought, like slow of thought as in like thinking through things. It's also connected with uh, constancy, with remaining constant in, in sort of an inevitable way. Um, people who have, uh, 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 you know, the Black Knight in in uh, in literature, a lot of his blackness wasn't necessarily even supposed to do with uh, his his death, uh, uh, idea of death and that sort of a thing. But as much as like my resolve cannot be broken, you cannot break me. I am inevitable. Right. <laughs> That's sort of the 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 concept that uh, we see in a lot of places with black actually being used in medieval knighthood heraldry uh when you see black you know you got the hospitalers used white and black um and there were other uh groups that did use black as well and the point was um death and being around death but also constancy like this is a constant mission um so i i just wanted to touch on black because i think that's you know for 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 all their you know, weirdness, the goths still somewhat have it right. They have this idea of seriousness <laughs> with 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 their with their art and with what they're into. And I'm talking about modern goths, not Visigoths and things of that nature. <laughs> um, but like modern goths actually do have this complex understanding, uh, not all of them, of course, but I'm saying ones who actually take it seriously and take their aesthetic seriously. Um of of what it means, you know, uh, it's not always just death. It's actually um, coming to grips with the inevitability of reality, <laughs> um, and 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 that sort of a thing. So I wanted to just point that out. Um, but yeah, I, I it, it, if you guys have stuff on that, great. Other guy, otherwise, I guess we can move on to some other examples of you know um, where we see this. Previously and in mo and in modern days, the the only thing uh, the only thing that I can think of is is the constancy thing, the reason why like nuns' habits are black. I believe so. I believe that's a a symbol of their perpetual uh the the perpetuality of their oaths, um, if I remember correctly. Right, and now we get into where things get interesting as to how stuff has changed, right? Because mm -hmm. even though there are some roots, like you mentioned McDonald's, right? Mm -hmm. The red is passion, hunger, that kind of deal. And so that, 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 or the, the hunger, which is a passion, and that ties back to the warrior, martyr, that thing, that was also a passion. So the passion element, the root is still there, but it's kind of shifted. Yes, yes. Um. Because modern day, the reason why most men wear black suits, even on their wedding day, is not so much that because, well, yeah, you can make an argument that it's the um, enduring, inevitable, constant sort of element to it. But also because, like, or at least for other functions, it's because black is invisible. Right. Which is a weird concept, but it... It, it's from a and, and this is where I guess it's less of a um, it's less of a this this is where black isn't taking I'm not talking about black's meaning You're which is about neutrality, neutrality in the the eye color palette yeah it's neutrality in the eye color palette allows it actually to work as an amazing accenter yes mm. and so if you, that's why you can pair black with almost any other color. I don't think almost like any other color except maybe brown. Mm -hmm. Right. You can, and I think there are some browns you can still do it with. Yes. But you pair it with black, it accents the color. If you're doing it tastefully in like a garment or a or a design or whatever. And this, but even with the well, I was gonna say this is where we get into the utilitarian argument of mm -hmm. you know are the utilitarian aspect of our colors in our culture. Almost all male colors now for clothes. You go and try and buy clothes. The most you're going to get is earth tones. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's it's very hard to find colorful male clothing of a casual nature anymore. Um, and and you can find some informal in in, in formal <laughs> situations. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but those are you know more like specific to events and that sort of a thing. 
it, <laughs> it's just it's really interesting to me because you know, in the medieval period, uh, even though there were beautiful, amazing gowns and stuff for the women, um, and they had bright colors too, th it was a big thing for men to have very flamboyant, crazy, over-the-top clothing. Um, go ahead, Brendan. Well, yeah, because that also tied back to heraldry. Mm -hmm. Who here knows what the colors of the Swiss Guard are? <laughs> bright orange and blue. Yeah, I think, yep. 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 Yeah, I think it's bright orange and blue. Yep. The they are very obvious. Now, remember the other point of heraldry. Heraldry wasn't just the symbol. It was also the color scheme. Right. And why do you have uniforms? Mm -hmm. Because the if you have a uniform, it means you have money to make all of the same type of clothing. And two, it means you have a lot of people. And when you see a lot of people wearing the same clothing, if you're an enemy army and you don't have that, you go... Oh no! It even reduces friendly fire too. You know, it reduces yeah, also fire happens. too. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a yeah, a, right. But I'm just talking about the psychological element, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And so, and so, you've got like like the Swiss Guard. They had their own heraldry, yes, for a while, but they also had their clothing, and those colors were bright. Anybody who knows who my dad, it, like one of his biggest gripes about all films set in the medieval era is that there isn't enough color. Yep. Everyone assumes they were dirty and muddy and dark and desaturated. He's like, no, people were clean. We have records about how many people died doing laundry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because they were bad at doing laundry. It's probably because they were doing laundry a lot. Right. There were lots of colors everywhere. Stop making everything so drab. Yep. And there, there was a lot of whites being cleaned all the time because they wanted to keep their colors bright, too. That was the other thing. They wore a lot of white underclothes because that was the natural kind of fabrics that you would get out of the ground. That was their version of, of, of utility. But they made sure that they covered that with the more expensive things. And they make, they they didn't wash the most more expensive things as often. But to keep them clean, you know, I mean, this is this is smart stuff. You know, they've got they they they, they pioneered the underclothes, you know, that, that we still have mm -hmm. today. I was going to mention Swiss Guard. Let's look at that real quick. Blue, azure. Uh, blue signifies a person's unwavering loyalty, chastity, faith, truth and strength. So it's loyalty more above. Like if I was going to boil it down, it would be loyalty. Right. Um, and then orange, which is a less common thing, but it does exist, usually designates ambition and drive for success. It's 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 a very uh, uh, focused, you know, disciplined sort of color. Uh, um, and 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 orange also has a lot of other components to it too. Hilariously, because of you know, uh, there there was her heraldry changes even during. We talk about modern heraldry changes. There's heraldry changes during the Reformation. William of Orange of the House of Orange. That was literally just his surname, right? And but it became the color of the Reformation in many places, particularly Ireland, where we have. The green signifying the Catholics and the orange on their flag signifying the Protestants. And so there's there's all kinds of extra meanings that get fed into this, but there's always some sort of like a neutral, especially for colors, a neutral, I would, and animals, a neutral like singular meaning that, that usually translates east to west too. Not always. Dragons are a good example of something completely different on both sides. Um, like you were saying, black and white are flipped in an interesting way. Um, but th this, the reason I wanted to kind of talk about this uh, for anyone who listens, A, it's interesting, but B, like, okay, so now that we know that this giant thing that's, uh, you know, under this iceberg, right? <laughs> or, or, you know, it's this iceberg. We see the little tip of it. We're like, oh, yeah, red. Uh, the bull on Looney Tunes would chase after the red. And so so there, there, there's oh, meaning there, right? Like, and and so uh, we, we, what can we do as artists to capitalize on this sort of, well, capital, you know, from our ancestors uh, how can we actually use it in ways that further um, our work and the heraldry itself, the good parts of the heraldry that have existed, that have, uh, you know, you been used so often and so effectively throughout the ages, you know? Yeah. I'm waiting to see if Alex has anything to say. 
because I know what my immediate answer is right off the top of my head to that question. I, I am artist adjacent, so <laughs> take a crack at it. Know your ancestors. Yes. Know what they did. I love the signs of the evangelists. Mm -hmm. No one knows who the signs of the evangelists are unless they've taken an art history class, and even then, it's like only a chance that you'll know what they are. Right. For those or they've listened to the podcast, or they've listened to the podcast, <laughs> right. and for those who haven't listened to the podcast, just really quick, signs of the evangelist. There are four gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one has a symbol. If you go to uh, cathedrals and other places of like Renaissance art, you might notice them. Matthew, winged man. Mark, winged lion. Luke, winged bull. John, eagle. They show up everywhere in cathedrals, either as little little statues like at the top of pillars just kind of sticking out or sitting on the shoulder of a person. If you see one of these animals sitting on the shoulder of someone, that means that the person that they're sitting on the shoulder of is who they represent. So a winged bull, this is Luke. That's actually right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's really, I mean, that. The, so, so how can we be using that in good ways? The signs of the the apostles. Uh, how can we be using? Uh, I'm looking just randomly right now. Grapes denotes industry and plenty. You know, uh, how can we be using gauntlet to signify military service or uh, fleur de lis uh, said to represent the Christian Trinity? Right. Um, we've got all these different the, the horn of plenty, the the crab, an uncommon symbol of patience and cunning. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> And because because crabs are ambush predators, right? They sit in the sand. Exactly, pop up. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I mean, this is this is fascinating stuff. And like, um, you know, I ha I have my ways that I use it, but I'm interested to hear you guys' take and what would be a proper use, what would be an improper use of this kind of knowledge. Or what are some examples we still see? You know, we mentioned McDonald's, but like, yeah. Well, logos so, are modern heralds. Yes, heralds are things. So and, do better, do better than that. The, and the people who make logos get that. Uh, the example that I would bring up is the original Apple logo. As I said, fan of Apple. Um, the original Apple logo after the Isaac Newton one, the the super intricate one that says apple computers inc on an arch on top uh the one that everybody knows the rainbow apple right uh the reason they have the bite out of the apple is to symbolize the uh eve's bite of, from the apple in the garden of eden or fruit in the garden of eden uh and the the lust for knowledge is what the designer said mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting that's not a christian way to do that no it's not which makes it which which makes it hard to like apple um, and the rainbow that they had was not a perfect rainbow. Right. It had the colors switched up. Right. In places. And it did that to represent anarchy and fighting against the system. This was 1984, right, whenever the IBM ad came out. Right. And they got it. And you can look at it, and it's still super iconic. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it's iconic because of that history that it's got. Right. right. Apple's been around for a while, so they can just do variations on the same thing and it'll still work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, and I'm I don't know if I'm about to steal your thunder, Joshua, but I think that part of what we do is we cut the minimalist garbage. Right? Mm -hmm. Um allow ourselves stop making everything to flat. Stop making everything flat. Stop making well, I mean uh, maybe you can do things flat. There's but... a place for flat. Oh, add... but yeah. some, some things being flat is great, but everything being... Yeah, add complexity. Mm -hmm. Um, Add add more color, not less. Right. Add, you know, just just add. <laughs> We've gotten to the point where we're middle millist. We can only move in one direction, guys. Yeah, yeah. That's just more. <laughs> well, I mean... So... It, 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 the the crazy thing is like a lot of the minimalist design does not take any of this into account any of this mm -hmm. stuff we're talking about over here um they're not taking into account what colors really mean they're not talking taking into account um 
the 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 various you know symbology they're using they're just piggybacking off of something that they originally had and trying to make it uh fit the squint test even better <laughs> <laughs> and the squint test is hel helpful don't get me wrong like knowing something immediately is really important but it is definitely not the only thing um mm -hmm. one of the things that uh any any good storyteller is going to tell you is where something is particularly simple, add complexity. Um, when you're creating a character, we, 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 it's a derogatory term to say that a character is one-dimensional nowadays, right? And yet we're trying to make all our logos more one-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> like, explain that one to me, right? Um, I, I saw a guy who was uh, uh, purposefully overcomplicating uh, but trying to make it work uh, uh, logos that have been taken back down to their most base parts. On I saw him on YouTube recently. He did um, Pringles, Monster Energy Drink, and um, I don't remember the third one he did, but they looked incredible. He actually like did some stuff that on paper doesn't make any sense. Give Mr. Pringle a body. He's never had one on one of the one of these cans. Give him give him a body. Uh, make him sort of like a showman. And 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 uh, they gave him like a a magic wand or something and a top hat and a, like whole nine yards. But like means it, it not only did it fit the squint test, you know, but it was actually really bold and beautiful. And he did a ton of shading and 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 stuff. And on the monster one, he took those three little marks that they have that are getting more and more flat as the years go on, and he turned it into uh, three openings into what looks like a r radioactive green liquid in the inside with a monster claw coming down, you know, and it, it looked incredible. You know, the textures on it and everything were amazing, and I just, I'm so uh, not just sick of minimalism because of... Uh, I don't like the way it looks aesthetically. I want everyone to understand that. Um, my main issue is you are purposefully shirking your duty to put thought and effort <laughs> into what you're designing. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and even if you are some kind of pagan or Buddhist or whatever, you've got some kind of rich something in there somewhere. I, Buddhist is really hard for me because it's all like give up everything. It's all, it's the Kylo Ren religion. Just, just kill it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but like for real, I, I just, I, I think this is why heraldry is so important. It ties us to our past, but it also like points us to what to do with all these colors and creatures and i don't even know what an s carbuncle is right off the top of my head but it's a symbol of a leader it was a series of clasps and bolts that strengthened the shield okay so it told me okay all right um you know there's there's so many things like this that the all the all this stuff was just fraught with meaning one way or another you know when you and, and this isn't just something that you know the medievals created you know, this isn't just something they thought up. They got it from what they observed in nature and wrote it down. I, when I was, um, okay, so here's an example of heraldry that I have used in, in, in my, um, in my life. You know, we had the DJ business growing up. I've told you guys about that many times. My dad ran a mobile DJ business for kids for birthday parties and that sort of a thing. When we first started doing it, we kind of just wore like casual polos and jeans and that morphed into dad wanted to be more party, more like, you know, because we were doing more dances where they'd have to follow us and he wanted us us to be more visible. So we moved to like Hawaiian shirts and that sort of a thing. And that's sort of your typical DJ thing when you really think about it. Um, but then I said, no. <laughs> I said, Dad, let, let me design something. He said, I'm, I'm going to look at whatever you give me, um, and I'll decide. I said, I took inspiration from two specific places, and they were both modern. The Wiggles and John Cena. John Cena! Du, 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 du. And so I said, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I said, okay, we each have a hat. And it has our name on it in yellow. Yellow is going to be our highlight color. 
right? It's going to be the gold. It's going to pop off of just about every col other color you put it on, right? So yeah, when we're going to have a T-shirt, we, uh, uh, it started out with solid colors, and then we printed our logo on it later. Our logo was already yellow. It was a yellow star with sunglasses, right? So it's already a perfect highlight color. Um, and so we decide. I decided you have a complimentary. You have a solid color for for each individual person. A nickname emblazoned across the hat as a name tag, basically, like you know, with the, with the embroidery. And then you have uh, athletic shiny shorts. Of, of a of a contrasting color under the t-shirt simple clean straightforward unimposing to the kids because that's already kind of the stuff that they wear right and they have a name that they can read if they can read if they can't okay they've got it they all have a name you know they, they at least know that they all have a name right and it's it was such a huge step for us and really separated us from a lot of other people because no longer was it Mr. DJ person who I'm not sure of your name. I think I may have heard you say it at the beginning of the night, but it was something adult and I'm a little kid, so I don't remember what it is. You're Papa Bear and you're Big Dog. I was Big Dog and you're happy and you're sissy, right? My sister was sissy, right? And so like we all had a persona, right? And this, we, we put thought into the persona and even kind of sort of played amped up versions of ourselves as characters for these shows, right? This is all thought that I'm putting in and taking things from pro wrestling, not just the John Cena look, but like the, 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 some of the aspects of my character being more aggressive, you know, and having a play off each other and, and some of the showmanship that came from that. And, you know, the Wiggles were such great great uh great little kid show that kids follow along with the music they're used to that kind of thing on tv already so i was able to pull from that and this is the kind of thing i'm trying to get at with heraldry you've got this huge thing over here what these medievals put together for you this huge aesthetic thing that still works today in 90 percent of the cases people are still using this they're using it less and less but they're still using it Learn this kind of thing, and it's going to supercharge your art. Learn how to use it in clever ways. Don't just sit there and be like, "Oh, I'm uh, I'm gonna throw uh, a a a fox in here, emblematic emblematic of intelligence and refusal to be captured." Okay, so I'm just gonna you know immediately make a character who you know he's gonna be a fox straight on the surface. That can work, Robin Hood. Um, it, it can work, you know, in, in certain places, but try to think of clever ways to be putting this sort of thing in here, right? Um, a character is having a hard time, right? And they go out on the deck of, you know, their house and, you know, I'm thinking like a modern kid in, you know, early 2000s emo kid, my parents don't understand me, you know, that kind of a thing. And you can have, I'm just scrolling through picking something. Uh, he's like, but I gotta keep going on. And he sees a hedgehog come out of the forest, an ancient symbol of cunning and perseverance. You know, just uh, that might not work, but at least you're trying to be clever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't have to be that level of pretentious either. You can, you can pick and choose mm -hmm. where you're going and just try and make it work. Experiment. That's a huge part of art. What are you saying, Alex? Uh, two thoughts the mm -hmm. the first thought that i had was depending on the type of film there are some types of movies where you could absolutely just have the hedgehog fall from the sky and hit your main character in the head yep absolutely i like that and then that, that immediately brought me to wes anderson mm -hmm. because i could totally see that happening in a wes anderson movie absolutely and also he makes very interesting use of color mm -hmm. so that's but that's an you know, interesting used to framing but whatever oh well does. True. yes the new trailer for his movie came out and the first frame i'm like oh wes anderson has a new movie and then it said directed by wes anderson and i'm like oh yeah yeah and see some of these things can become your signature too you know poetry has kind of become my signature in the in the, the type of poetry that i do it's very lyrical it's very I, I try not to be super pretentious with it and make it as too esoteric i want it to be 
narrative grounded poetry that just it sticks with you like like a, a, a tasty casserole. <laughs> you know? um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many uh, uh, possibilities with this sort of thing. I just I want people to start thinking about it. I want people to start looking stuff up and and, uh, you know, anytime you want to you want to evoke a certain emotion you look it up you figure out different ways that you can do that without just you know saying it was a cold and dreary day right mm -hmm. um and 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 make it fit what you're doing i mean if you're telling a little kid's story if you're doing an abc dungeons and dragons book you're not going to be you know specifically putting in oh um <laughs> ink moline the center of a mill wheel as an emblem of industry <laughs> You know, to signify the capitalism of uh, uh, capitalizing on Dungeons and Dragons books for kids, <laughs> you know, whatever. Like you're not gonna do that, but you might, uh, uh, you know, depending on what it is, find something that works for you. And so I'm just saying, man, the whole world is full of meaning. Go mm -hmm. out and look at it. If y'all have anything to add, we will. Otherwise, we can move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Uh. One last thing to add, on top of animals and stuff like that, there is actually, it seems to me, from my position at least, kind of a renaissance in a specific sphere of the internet of meaning as far as flowers go. Yes. My sister uh, saw a book, I believe she saw it advertised on a like sewing YouTube channel, uh, and it's called Floriography, mm -hmm. where it talks about the different meanings of different flowers, and... So as far as symbolism and art goes, at least as far as creating a movie, it's super easy to have the background of your scene have flowers in it. Mm -hmm. If you're walking through a park, plant, I don't know what marigolds mean, but plant marigolds in the background to evoke the emotion that you're trying to say with this scene. Tolkien did Stuff that. like that. Or or if or or if it would be easier to do it in a garden, like at home, rather than going out and planting flowers in a park. If you're yeah. have to film on location, <laughs> fair enough. Yes, he peered but between he, he peered between the hemlock leaves and saw their uh, uh, flowers. Fl uh, he peered between the hemlock leaves and saw their wonder flowers of gold, something like that, upon her mantle and her sleeves and. Her hair like shadow shimmering. Yeah, it's it, like the hemlock is, is a symbol of the fact that the, like them meeting each other is going to lead them to their death and their doom because hemlock is poison. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's it, it, there's more to it than that, but that's part of it, you know. So I guess if I may only if I may add just two quick things. Sure. Um, one, yes, there is meaning in the world. And yes, um, like like the the medievals found these meanings, but like going back to Genesis real quick, God told Adam to ma name the animals. When he told him to name the animals in Hebrew, the name reflects the nature. So he told them to study the animals. The nature of the animal informed its name. The same kind of applies with the mm -hmm. medieval symbology. Yes, we talk about utilitarianism and like, you know, how we're not a fan of just pure utilitarianism, but right. sometimes the utility of something helps build into the meaning. Absolutely. So that's one. Yeah. But uh, two, I, right. I, I know we all agree with that. I just yeah. feel like it's good to say it. Yeah, for sure. Two, you know, when you're saying, oh, come up, you know, use this heraldry and stories and all this stuff, I'm still thinking of hel heraldry as the symbol that represents something. Mm -hmm. So make and I mean, make better heraldry, mm -hmm. make better logos. And the thing about a heraldry, a heraldry itself, yes, it represents your past. It represents your that. So make sure your heraldry has good meaning to it. And then represents you and your history and all of that, your lineage, etc. But then also remember that it can be added to anything. Yeah. Logos. You know, like add it to your mugs, add it to your shirts, add it to, um, add it to the top of your the top of the the, the door frame of your house. Mm -hmm. Add it to all kinds of stuff. Put it as the main home button on your website. You know, when you make this thing, make the herald, make the heraldry, and then use it everywhere. And the main thing, I, I again, I but we really have to focus on. Make your heraldry 
well, do a good job at that. Yes. Yes. That's good. So I'll move on from there. I'm Ian Wilson, and I create graphic art using primarily traditional methods, supplementing with digital where it's needed. I use a real pen, a real paper, a real graphite to make my art. I like to feel my art. I've always been this way. I love the feeling of a pen or pencil in my hand, the sound of graphite scratching paper, and I love the sight of a nice black line making its way across the page. So why choose traditional art over digital? Traditional art has an organic, natural quality that seems to be missing from most digital illustrations. The illustrated books and comics that were made in the days before digital have an excellence and staying power that is just as vibrant now as it was decades ago. These are the stories that stay with you. Dr. Seuss, Winnie the Pooh, Where the Wild Things Are. People still read these. I'm currently working on my own graphic novel series, Legend of the Swordbearer, and I've also had the privilege to draw graphics for two motion comic series, along with illustrations for a small magazine, Logos Sophia magazine, and various book covers. Don't let traditional art fade into the dust. Help me keep it alive. You won't regret it. Visit my website at iantomaswilson.com. The brood's been interesting lately, guys. That's another statement. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, in the uh, earlier today the uh, <laughs> the 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 joke about uh, the, the the Alex did the the meme for good gracious the. Uh, Ha- harem anime peanut gallery uh, peanut gallery harem anime <laughs> peanut gallery <laughs> go back stop go back <laughs> go back no i said go back for those who know what we're talking about you're welcome uh, but you um, know those of you who don't know what we're talking about you're welcome exactly um, <laughs> just good inside jokes and stuff but i mean the brood is outgrowing joshua david ling as a brand and as just you know um I don't mean to sound pretentious that way. I just don't know how else to to say it, especially when joshuadavidling.com is the home for all this stuff. Um, I think doing it with my name made it made made more sense because it allowed me more room to experiment. This is just Joshua doing his weird stuff, and I don't think that brand is going away or anything. But mm-hmm. I feel like the babies are growing up and they're leaving the nest, and I need to start making sure that they have a place to go. <laughs> Um, uh, the baby brands of Poets at War, uh, particularly, and The Brood, uh, I think are are further along. I think Poetry for Warriors is still a ways off. That's the newest of them all. Um, but as far as all this stuff goes, and I know it's just, but we talked about heraldry. We talked about brand. We talked about iconography. I don't want to be too precious about these things and talk about them as if they're not the things that they are, that they're something in a vacuum, you know? They're not. Mm-hmm. But, like, I don't know. Both functionally, uh, I'm seeing things move more toward Discord. I'm I'm really excited about the stuff that Alex has done in Discord. For those of you who haven't checked that out, joshuadavidling.com slash Discord. That's a redirect uh, that can take you to the brood, and you can join up there. Um, we've had a few people join up recently, um, but I just don't know, like, where if things need to change when things need to change and i figured like putting it out there for people who listen uh is always a good idea and who actually take part uh in the brood but also just brainstorming with you guys you guys have really you know helped me and taken the reins of some of the ownership of this stuff just by helping me record twice a month in this variety show format um, we've been, you know, good friends. We're generally on the same page about most things, but we have just enough variation that I actually feel like we're getting places, you know, in everything that we put our mind to as a team. So it's like, okay, what do we do about this? Am I crazy for seeing it kind of spilling out over the edges or am I right? You're not crazy. Or I should say, this isn't a sign of you. This is not a sign of you. This is not a sign of your craziness. We know you're crazy, but this is not. You're still in touch with reality on this point, I think. (laughs) We're we're all a little crazy here. We're all mad. We're all a little mad here. There you go. (laughs) Mad here. There we are. Yes. Uh, uh, Alex, do you have anything you want to say before I 
jump in because I have a tendency to dominate conversations. Yes. No, I'll, I'll, if I, if I think of something, I will interrupt you. So I think that, oh, please do, by the way, do, you have my permission. I know I don't need to give you permission, but please interrupt me. Um, I think you're right. It is spilling over. I still think you're the core. You always will be the core. Um, whether or not you want to shift the domain, like get a new domain and have people who type Joshua David Ling get redirected automatically to that domain. Um, if you want to change it to like thebrood.com or however you want to organize it or whatever, you know, like, cause you like, as far as I'm concerned, that's aesthetic, right? right. How you, your, your name, your brand, your whatever, that's all aesthetic stuff. But you, what you've been doing and, um, maybe I'm retreading our old ground or just saying stuff like your, you know, your sort of mission statement was to be a place for Christian artists to grow, to find community, to, you know, bounce ideas off each other, chat, you know, do what a community does with, we just happen to have the same shared, uh, the same shared traits of being Christian and being article, yeah, and being artists of one form or another, and wanting and that, and now we're talking about like you know you say it's spilling over. I'm thinking about Sarah and Logo Sophia. Mm -hmm. Um, Ian, he has his trailer somewhere in <laughs> in the you know uh, in the in these in these episodes, his trailer pops up. Um, you know, we have these. I'm trying to do something. Um, you're doing your all of your stuff. You're leading by example functionally, right? So I don't think that it's. I I mean, you're still the core. You're still the thing that should be like the root center, and people go, they see you, and then they go, oh, and see all these other things. But if you're if you're concerned about trying to, about the aesthetics, whatever, that's like a huge topic that would right. take, like probably months of right. talking about to nail down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um. <laughs> Like things moving toward Discord, having options like direct links to Logo Sophia and seeing all of those articles and stuff. Like, like it is spilling over. Like the fact of the matter is, I've been reading more of, I've been looking at her site more because of you. Right. I didn't know about her except through you. Right. And so I think to a certain degree, while you definitely have your own, own brand and you are the core and you've got your poetry, you've got your poetry bricks you've got your stories you've got your guardians of atlanta the space thing you've been working on and all of that you're also serving as a gateway to a larger hub world almost right where each of us has a tiny little door that we can go up and 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 people can come in and enter and look around and see Right. You're almost like a Ren Fair for us in a way, you know. Fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are a one man Ren Fair that happened a one man digital Ren Fair or 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 or, or convention or right. something, right? Yeah, yeah. So 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 when when it's spilling over, I think that's what you're talking about is that sort of being a gateway to others. So you're, you're still your the confederacy principle of this sort of thing is actually better than uh trying to uh the only thing i'm concerned about is something like um you know uh uh i won't say who i know this from and whatever else because i was not directly involved but um wretched with todd friel is a show that can only be todd friel and it's only ever mm -hmm. todd friel todd friel goes wretched goes I don't want what I'm doing with the brood and with, you know, the, the, the other stuff that I'm connected to, to be like Joshua goes, everything else goes. You see what I'm saying? Like, um, and, and so that's the thing that I'm actually more afraid of than anything, but it sounds like you're saying this is far more of a confederacy and that's a good thing. This is much more of a loose grouping of artists um, it, 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 because Andrew Peterson went the route of, you know, uh, him and his buddies, uh, went the route of creating the rabbit room. Andrew's sort of the spokesperson for the rabbit room and a couple other people, but mainly him. Um, and like they have the rabbit room as its own thing. That seems to kind of be where our brood is. But if you're thinking in terms of the Avengers, 
and I'm Iron Man, I guess, in this situation, you know, sure, whatever, then, like, okay, uh, what, uh, do, is it, is it, do we need a Marvel Studios, or is it cool just letting whoever is doing what they're doing make their own movies in the, sh in the shared universe? I'm liking the idea of having everything that broad, and that, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's 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 different, and there are a few places where I see that happening. One of the ones that's an example to me is all the people kind of surrounding Jonathan Young on YouTube, um, who does uh, you know Cole McGinnis? I know you know Cole McGinnis. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, John, yeah. John, he got kind of famous partially through Jonathan Young. Jonathan Young's one of these guys that did like the Disney covers, and that's how he kind of got famous, uh, metal Disney covers and stuff. But he does a lot more stuff, and he's an amazing artist, right? Um, and, and he and Caleb Hiles are kind of like the two high end kind of guys and they collaborate with each other and they cross over, but there's, there's no, like they, they didn't start their own record label or anything. Um, mm -hmm. so like, is that kind of what you're saying that this Confederacy idea is actually working better and probably the way the world's going to go? Cause that's kind of what I'm hearing. I, what I'm I saying, mean, oh, Alex, go, go, go ahead. I, I, I I, I'm not sure that uh, Brennan is saying that, but I believe that. I, I, I think that that is absolutely where the world is going. I think that decentralized is definitely the way that the world is moving, even with the emerging technologies. Uh, cryptocurrency may or may not take off, but blockchain is the future of all of the internet in yeah. all likelihood. Yeah. That's all about decentralization. So I would... I definitely believe that decentralization is the way to go. Well, you know I'm and no Machiavellian. Analogy. You know I'm no Machiavellian. <laughs> so exactly. And, and your Marvel analogy just makes me more convinced of that point because we've seen what happened to Marvel Studios. And now I'm sad. But well, go, Brent. Um, I don't like the Marvel analogy, partly because I'm not a fan, as big a fan of superheroes. I would prefer to think of it more almost like a Knights of the Round Table. Okay. And you're Arthur. Okay. Your analogy is better. The point of a round table, of the round table, was that all of the knights were equal, right? And when Arthur was sitting at it, he was theoretically on par with them. Right. But he was still their king. Right. And they still swore fealty to him. I'm not saying that we as Christian artists are swearing fealty to you. <laughs> but my point is... You are in charge, at least of this place for now, but each of us does still have the freedom to be able to do this, and we still should be respectful to each other and each other's work. Now, we will have our spats. Yes. Me and course. Ian have spats. Me and Ian have Way spats. more than we reasonably should, but <laughs> we have spats. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um I, I say that. I, I can only remember really one. I think we agree more than we disagree, but oh, yeah. the point is... Like, we will disagree with each other, but, like, part of the, like, but we're still there to support each other, and we're meant to build each other up. Right. I think maybe from, like, if we want to talk logistics, it might pay to have the brood, if you want to call this a brood, if you want to keep that branding. I do. Um, Have the brood be its own thing. Right. You are the head of it still, but your stuff is not exactly it's not a oh, separate entirely, but like the brood is like like almost like again. I I'm thinking of like, I mean I'm picturing Warframe because I played that recently, but I'm thinking of like a hub, literally just a central room. That is the brood. It's just this room, and we all have our own little doors. Your door just happens to be bigger and shinier because you were the one who started this thing, and so therefore you should have the bigger and shinier door. Right. Right. Okay. I, I, you you paid me a uh, uh, huge compliment and part of that, and I just want to recognize it with a with a joke. Um, Brendan, are you saying that I am the um, <clears throat> soldier poet king? Anyway, <laughs> just because a watery tart throws a sword at you doesn't make you a king. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. There you go. Uh, uh, yes, boy. you are a soldier poet king in a way. There you go. Well, alay alay alor. My my kids a uh, song and they they get like really hyped for the the tempo change up the up the up tempo change bit yep and they they act like it's a, a freaking dubstep drop it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> kids be kids. Oh, I love it. I do the same thing. It's not just kids. <laughs> Unless I am a You kid. are a kid. Come on now. Okay. We're all kids. We're all kids. We're all kids. Shake reform. There you go. <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. Anyway. Um, yeah. Well, I think that pretty much covers what we were going to talk about today. So uh, the next episode is going to be uh, on the topic of Star Wars. Why? I'm not sure. But these guys wanted to talk Star Wars, and I am more than game. So he wanted to watch talk Star Wars. I'm just sitting here going, okay, what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch the fireworks. <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I think we're we're a little bit more kind than most Star Wars fans, so there's that. But uh, yeah. So um, with all that being said, everybody, be your family's bard. Do not turn to the right or to the left, and the Lord will be with you wherever you go. We'll see you next time in the trenches on Poets at War.